Perfect. I think we should be recording now. So let me just share a screen. Just for the use of anyone who's uh, possibly watching this recording later on. So it's the week three, Wednesday. And um, on these Wednesday sessions, uh, what I've tried to do is that we go through something that's useful for you in terms of completing the homework um, and that doesn't get covered while our in-class time. And I think that this week really probably the most useful thing is to go through the quiz part for the homework. And uh, I do help hold these uh, sessions both in the morning, so now at 10 o'clock, and then in the evening as well, another one at 8 o'clock. Uh, I'm trying to keep these in about an hour. And uh, sometimes there are a little bit more structures, sometimes there are a little bit less, uh, especially when it's a small group. I welcome you to just unmute yourself or use the chat and just shout out at any time if you have anything that I can help with. These sessions are here to uh, help you and I want to make them uh, useful so you get everything you need. Uh, but also I want to make them uh, so that they do have a structure so you're not just hanging out with me if you don't happen to have any questions. So like I said, this week we've been looking at the blood and a couple of things. I'm going to jump over the objectives. I'm still updating that a little bit. A couple of things that I just kind of on a general level wanted to mention. Uh, for this week, all the work that you have to do is listed here on this slide. So there is going to be a quiz. And uh, the quiz is probably the one that carries the most points. So 15 points towards your final grade and it's due at the end of the week. Uh, unusually from what we see normally in the quizzes, which I try to keep at about 50 questions. This time there's 52, five questions in total. So there's a five more questions, but they all add up to that 15 points. So that's really what we'll be focusing on on this session, unless you have something else that you do want to uh, talk about, something else that comes up. Uh, we'll also spend a little bit uh, time, or we'll, we'll spend a full class session tomorrow on completing the lab, which is all about blood typing. So that's why we covered on yesterday's se class session during uh, in-person time, the blood typing generics kind of on a the theory level. And we will we'll get to apply that. And I think that if everything goes well and I have all the materials that I'm expecting to have, uh, we will be completing uh, ABO blood type determination for every student. So if that's something that you're curious to see what blood type you are and seeing how that all works in a uh, person, in, in your case, we'll, we'll get to do that. And then there is the element of the practice anatomy, which is basically really just anatomical structures, naming things. And uh, that is something that's completed on the uh, on your publisher's website. And uh, I don't think that there's too much that I can teach about that. It is really just taking the time and memorizing the structures. But that is also all the material that you'll be then taking towards your, um, your practical exam. So that's what I've got planned for today. Uh, but as I said, these sessions are here to make it useful for you. So at any stage, feel free to shout out. If you don't want to chat while the recording is going on, you can just let me know and I'll just pause it and we'll, we'll take it, especially if it's something that's like technical issues on, on your um, getting things running and so on. Before we make too much of a start, uh, I know that I gave as a new element in a class this handout that tried to summarize the key points of what you really need to know about the theory-wise. 
of the chapter. And you'll see again on that, that different learning styles, some people learn by picking up those key terms and using them to guide them on what to focus on. Um, some people benefit from using colors, so I've used a little bit of color coding there as well uh, that hopefully might be of a help. And because it was right at the end of this class that we went through it, I felt that uh, that might have been a little fast. So I have uploaded this on our canvas. It's found there as a blood class handout or class notes, I think under one of those names um, on the learning material. But I also wanted to quickly review them on, on this session just so that no one feels that they didn't have a chance to go through these. Uh, typically, I try not to upload or post the actual files for these. Um, there's a bit of a longer story with that. Uh, I just do these on some classes and some students really enjoy them, some don't. And sometimes I end up finding uh, things that I've done in the past online. And uh, I try to limit the amount of uh, stuff that I, I kind of give the direct files because I uh, do draw everything and do all of this uh, myself. So I, I try to keep a little bit of the copyright around. But let's have a look of the blood chapter. So we saw that blood was a special type of connective tissue. And one of the main functions that we saw was the transport of gases. We saw also transport of nutrients, transport of waste products, trans transport of hormones. So many things there. Uh, two other things that I would probably add here in addition to the transport would be the regulation. So we saw that the blood was excellent in water or fluid contents in different parts of the body, regulating that, regulating temperature at different parts of the body. So that kind of a um, regulatory function and then the protective function that blood also has in terms of the white blood cells regulating against any pathogens that might uh, might be invaders to the body that shouldn't be there, uh, as well as I think that uh, we talked a little bit about regulation of things like not bleeding uncontrolled, so the clotting process. So all of those good go there. You'll see that um, I kind of use a few different textbooks in different classes that I teach. So there's a, uh, there's a few things that could be added there. But there's the regulatory and protective functions as well to keep on mind. Um, the components of the blood here, we have a sketch of a microscopic image that we might see. And again, the pro uh, kind of relationship of what we're seeing there is not quite accurate, but it gives us an idea. So the liquid matrix was uh, the plasma. So everything else that we'll see making the uh, blood, so the formed elements, is embedded into this plasma. So it floats within the plasma. And this is made of mostly water. There are some other components. We talked about few important proteins. And then all of these things that are tied into the functions of the blood, for example, in terms of the transport uh, that we could find also within the plasma. Um, other than the plasma, uh, all other things that we end up finding in the blood are actual concrete cells or parts of the cells. And these are known collectively as formed elements of the blood. And the form out of the uh, formed elements, uh, the definitely the largest proportion, about 45% of the total content of the blood, is made by red blood cells. And on this microscopic image or sketch of a mi what we would see in a microscope, we can see these as these rounded, biconcave-shaped uh, red blood cells. And you remember that biconcave shape referred to the fact that it was kind of a, like a disc that's been pinched from the middle a little thinner. Um, 
The main function of these red blood cells, which we also know as erythrocytes, is to carry oxygen and their life cycle is about four months that they stick around. Uh, so not quite as quick turnaround as with some of the others. Then I wanted to say a few words about the white blood cells. There's just a few types that I've marked here. Uh, white blood cells known as leukocytes and uh, they were characterized by the fact that here we do see the nucleus and their function involved mainly the immune system. And I shared with you during the class that I probably will ask in the exam about putting these in order of what's the most common and what's the least common of the white blood cells. And um, I gave a mnemonic, never let monkeys eat bananas. So we would go from neutrophils being the most common, lymphocytes the second most common, third most common, monocytes, then the second least common, eosinophils, and the least common ones, basophils. That would make a really good exam question. Uh, for the platelets, platelets were these small cell fragments that played a role in the coagulation, which is the fancy word for clotting of the blood. So if we have bleeding, for example, that that bleeding eventually stops as gap gets formed and so on. Clotting can also happen accidentally when we don't want clotting to take place. If there's an abnormal a clot or clot that shouldn't be there, we call it thrombus. An embolus is one of these clots that then travels around the body. And that can be quite a big concern for us if it ends up to the lungs or to the heart where it shouldn't and blocks the circulation. The term that we didn't really talk about was the right red blood cell, white blood cell counts, we can count the number of cells per volume unit of blood as well. And just really quickly, I wanted to share about the blood typing. So blood typing helps us to determine what type of uh, blood we have um, and also plays important role in the blood transfusion. So the donor recipient matches that we and this table is pretty much in alignment what we just discussed in the class. So if you had a blood type A, you would end up having then the alleles uh, where at least one of them is inherited, if not both, uh, for the A and the antigens on the surface of the uh, red blood cell uh, from one of the parents. In some cases, from both. And if you have antigen A's on the surface of the red blood cell, the antibodies that would be then in your body would be anti-B antibodies. So you could give for a person with blood type A blood transfusion from an, another individual whose blood type is also A, that would not cause issues. But if you give blood type B or blood type AB, we will now have these antigens B antigens that we are transfusing to an individual who has anti-B antibodies. And that would cause an issue because the blood would now clot and uh, there would be a rejection uh, of the blood transfusion. The other thing to note there is that, of course, we remember that if you are blood type O, uh, you do not have any of those sprinkles as we talk, so any of those antigens on the surface of those red blood cells, so your blood can be donated to anyone at all. And that made the blood type O a universal donor. Your blood can be given to anyone. Uh, we can use the same form, uh, same uh, logic for looking at the blood type B, so you either need to inherit the allele from one or both of your parents for the uh, B antigens, and you would then have antibodies for A, A sprinkles, if you wish, on top of the uh, red blood cells. So you cannot mix 
B and A, there's a rejection, but you can mix B with B. That's the same blood type that you're owning from the, uh, from the donor. And the AB would be problematic because, again, we have some of those A antigens then on the surface of the uh, donor's red blood cells. So clotting will happen. And we remembered, oh, nothing there, so you can donate that to anyone. Uh, AB is a combination. You can only end up being blood type AB if you inherited an allele for A and another allele for B. So each one of the parents needed to give a different one on that. Uh, you do not end up having any antibodies against um, then to anything else. So you can receive blood from anyone at all. So blood type AB is that universal uh, recipient. You can receive blood from anyone at all. And blood type O, remember, there are no O sprinkles. So that just simply means that there are no antigens on the surface of the red blood cells. So the only way you are going to become blood type O is that you inherit an allele for that from each of the parents. And you will end up having antibodies for A and B. So that's why there will be a rejection if you get any other blood type than your own, which is the blood type O. Um, we talked a little bit about Rh positive and negative uh, individuals and uh, really if you're Rh positive that related to the, having the antigen D present and most of Americans fell within this group. Uh, if you are Rh negative you do not have this antigen and the issue was really on the second pregnancy after the blood has mixed during the first delivery between the mother and the child. Now, mother would then start rejecting the embryo that's developing uh, within them, and that would be a problem. A couple of uh, clinical considerations. If you have a loss or destruction, so low amounts of red blood cells, you are anemic, and hemoglobin was that protein that was responsible for transporting oxygen and uh, was made of four subunits, so uh, if we could fit in four oxygen atoms there. What I'm going to do super quick here, I'm just going to get a charger so I don't lose the connection to you, so bear with me just for a 30 seconds. So this should help. Is there anything I can help with at this point? Yes, I have a question. Can you hear me? I can hear you if you can hear me. <laughs> um, I was wondering if the questions about the RH, is that going to be on the quiz? So I'm still a little bit confused. Yeah. In the quiz, there might be a couple of questions. We're going to go the quiz questions through just in a uh, second, so I'll make sure to highlight those for you. I know that okay, sweet. a little bit lots to take in, so let's go through them together. That's a, I'll make sure that we cover that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate you pointing that out. So really, what I was going to do now was to actually jump to the uh, waste materials. So if you let me just share that screen. And uh, like I said, there's 55 questions. So let me share the right window. So you should be able to see a um, um, screen from the publisher's website and uh, these are all the questions that are going to come up in the blood quiz so we're going to go through them over the next uh let's say half an hour or so and i'm going to focus especially on that rh positive negative aspect uh, i i completely understand that we went through it a little bit fast so what you're being asked on uh, this question order might be mixed around a little bit depending on 
um, who takes the quiz, but we're going to use this to guide us through the things that are important there. On this first question, I'm asking you to classify the stages of erythropoiesis. And we remember that that referred to the uh, production of the red uh, or production of the erythrocytes, so our red blood cells. And we didn't really go into this in great detail in the class, so that's why I want to show it here. So what we're seeing here first is that when we're talking about pluripotent stem cells, these are the stem cells that uh, can become any kind of a cell uh, possible. So they are completely open. They are not committed to any path yet. Um, that's really the good uh, characteristic of the stem cells and why stem cells treatment, stem cell therapies, uh, hold so much potential for future. Are you able to see this screen? If not, to give me a shout out. I'll, I think it's a little small. I'll try to zoom in uh, whenever I remember. Uh, but give me a shout out if something doesn't show up the way you expect. So pluripotent stem cells, remember that those are the cells that can become uh, any type of the cell at all. When we talk about colony forming units, uh, these would be the red blood cells that have receptors for factors that stimulate the development. So that's really, if you think of the uh, development path, the second one to notice there. Uh, for the precursor cells, we have two to consider. So first of all, reticulocytes, uh, in this point, um, is kind of a, we can consider it as a step between the, uh, what we just saw at the colony forming unit and between the mature cells. And another one that I do want to highlight that would fit in there would be the erythroblasts. And of course, the mature red cell is then the erythrocyte, so the red blood cell. So really on this question, all I'm asking you to do is to drag these to the right boxes uh, when you're completing the quiz. Um, and again, if I go through anything too fast or you have further questions, just don't hesitate, shout out. I think that that's usually the, uh, I try to monitor the chat, but I've got a few windows open so that that can sometimes uh, slide past me. I'm by no means ignoring any questions. Um, and I want it to be things that help you. The second one that I wanted to talk about uh, in relation to the production of the platelets and I didn't use this term in our class, but poesis was the production. In this case, thrombopoesis refers to the production of the platelets. So when we're producing platelets, uh, there's a diagram here, and I'm asking you to drag the right things to the right place. And we're seeing here quite a lot of the things that we've already seen before. So the platelets were these small uh, cell fragments that were flowing around within the blood and proplatelets then would be these, uh, these uh, on this diagram kind of more prominent structures that then give rise to, to what we're going to be talking next. Endothelium simply refers to the side of the uh, blood vessel so uh, it's made of endothelial wall and sinusoid of bone marrow. Um, it could be, if we're looking here, um, this doesn't have to be blood vessel. This could also be within the bone, so the very uh, central part of the uh, bone, especially long bones. Uh, what we see there are a good old friend red blood cell here. So that was characterized by the... Uh, by the uh, biconcave disc shape, white blood cells, you remember they were larger in size and stained darker on H and E stain, uh, me megakaryocyte, um, these cell sheds the platelets into the sinusoids of the bone marrow. So um, in this case, we're not really looking at the blood vessel. Uh, this would be the uh, cell that contributes the contents within to the bone marrow. And then these propylatelets become platelets as part of that development. 
So those would be all the parts that I'm asking you to match as part of that uh, question. Some of these questions are a little repetitive, so that's why I'm focusing on the ones the first time, and if they come again, then we'll tackle. What I'm asking in the next question is for us to describe the general functions of the cardiovascular system. So this is really just a kind of where we started our class. And we see these three functions, transportation, protection, and regulation. And transportation, I'm asking you to identify from a list of things that which all would be examples of transportation. So, of course, the movement of oxygen to the tissues of the body, movement of carbon dioxide from the tissues to the lungs, uh, transportation of hormones, movement of urea to the kidneys. So what we want to remove from the blood is the urea, and that's done by the kidneys. Uh, the waste product is the urine. Uh, individual with high urea contents, when, for example, there's kidney failure, kidneys are not working, you can start seeing, for example, the eye whites end up being more yellowish and so on. Um, distribution of absorbed nutrients throughout the body, body that would be a in an example of transportation of material. If we talk about the regulatory functions, let's jump there. Um, next, Cut two examples of these, this list that would fit in there really nicely are the bicarbonate buffer acids and bases. So the buffers that help us to maintain the BH within that very narrow range that we talked about in the class. So blood pH was maintained within 0.1 uh, units, so which is a very, very uh, small window. So that's thanks to the buffers. And if you remember, we talked about buffers, I believe, on 181 or 156, at least when I teach those classes, we spend a good amount of time talking about buffers. Their function is basically just to eliminate any changes on the pH. And they're very successful. Another regulatory function um, that we touched up on in the class was the regulation of the body temperature or regulation to temperature. Uh, so we maintain the constant temperature. We protect the core organs and uh, we can get rid of if there's extra heat that we need to get rid of. So this was done either by uh, constricting or dilating the blood vessels. And we're going to be talking about vasoconstriction, vasodilation in our week where we cover the blood vessels. So not the next one after the exam, but the one after that. We're going to talk about that in, in a greater detail. What does the vasoconstriction and vasodilation uh, involve, but simply we're at this point talking about, if you want to think of it as uh, making blood vessels narrower or larger so that the blood can go to the areas where it's needed or where, where the temperature needs to be taken. And finally, in terms of the protective functions of the blood, um, blood played an important role in helping us to destroy pathogens. So pathogen is any invader to the body and formed elements really play a key role on that, especially the white blood cells. We talked about the platelets, which helped us to form the clot or the block or the scab, whatever term you wish to use, if there is an actual uh, break in the blood vessel wall. So platelets played an important role on that. And the final one that I have here is the globulins that contribute to the elimination of infectious agents. So again, remember that it is working against any pathogens and infectious agents could be an example of those pathogens. And again, like I said, I'm going to go through these, but at any point, just shout out <laughs> if there's anything. Um, here I'm asking you to match, again, these phrases, descriptions with the appropriate formed element. So let's have a look of those. And we're going to start with the red blood cells, so erythrocytes, and their main function was the transportation of respiratory gases. We talked especially about the oxygen. And then we have a bunch of white blood cells that I want to talk here. And we're going to start with the lymphocytes. Lymphocytes are the 
uh, white blood cells that produce the antibodies or end up differentiating into cells that produce the antibodies. Uh, they do include the memory cell lines, and we'll talk about memory cells uh, later on when we talk about immune system. So at this point, uh, as long as you have that kind of statement in your mind, that's the level of detail that we're looking. And um, we do end up naturally having in our body cells that end up being cancerous or they have viral infection. And your body normally just ends up dealing with those. And it is thanks to the lymphocytes that we're able to deal with those. So they destroy all of these if there's a precancerous cell or cell that shows cancerous characteristics or if they are infected uh, through a virus. So before the situation gets out of hands, it's the lymphocytes that help us to deal with. Neutrophils, the next type of white cell that I wanted to mention, they increase in numbers during the bacterial infections. So that's again why we do the white blood cell count. We look at, oh, if we would end up finding that you have abnormally high numbers of neutrophils in your body, you probably have a bacterial infection going on somewhere. So that's why blood tests again can tell us so much about what's going on. We might not know exactly where, but we know where to focus our resources and that let's look for bacterial infections. Basophils played important role as a visodilatory and anti agglutory function, so uh, controlling the dilation, clotting formation, uh, and they are important uh, for initiating the inflammatory responses. Uh, so any type of a response to inflammation um, basophils would be important there. Of course, we remember that sometimes that can be an uh, over-the-top reaction to something that's not really an issue, so we might have inflammatory responses when that shouldn't happen, and that's when our immune system is working wrong. And again, we'll go into this uh, to a greater detail in the, um, in the chapter where we focus on the immune system. Eosinophils, they play a role, especially when dealing with parasites and monocytes, uh, when we need to then do what they've described here as immune clearance. Um, and they are capable to differentiate into dendritic cells and macrophages. So they are, again, able to then respond to whatever is needed, but especially uh, getting rid of things uh, in, in terms of using the immune system there. So these would be the terms that I'm looking you to match on that question. And uh, if we look the next question here, I'm asking you to match again the formed elements with their descriptions. So very similar to what we've seen uh, here, really, I'm just uh, mainly doing the names of the terms, but I've added some other fact there. So red blood cells were the erythrocytes, you remember those. Uh, this cell type, a white blood cell that we saw where we had multiple lobules of the, the nucleus were neutrophils. They're the most common leukocyte. Remember, our mnemonic never let monkeys eat bananas. So neutrophils, the most common one. Monocytes, uh, again, there's a nice picture to give you a clue what you can expect to see uh, there for these type of white blood cells, eosinophils, that was the kind of by uh, two parts of the uh, nucleus, by nucleus. And uh, again, we see a lot of granules here. The second least common. Uh, basophils, um, the least common of the white blood cells, and uh, they are characterized by this large nucleus uh, that really contains these, these uh, large granules within the cytoplasm as well. And lymphocytes, finally, no granules, very little cytoplasm. The nucleus takes over pretty much all of the uh, cells area. I do have some notifications popping up, so uh, I don't think they were from this class, but if there's anything, just do let me know. I don't want to ignore any questions. Uh, 
that might be coming up. Um, I'm going to move on to the next one if we don't have questions of this. Um, and here I'm asking you whether we can give the transfusion to the, um, to the whether the donor and the recipient are a good match. And here now we are in including also the RH groups. So we're not just doing the ABO typing, we're also doing the RH groups. So that kind of starts to answer to the part that we did, didn't have quite as much time to talk about. So let's have a look what you can give to who. So if you have blood type O, you could give it to the uh, to the individual who had blood type A. And if it's an RH negative, you can give that to RH positive individual. So RH negative can be given to RH positive if it's the same blood type in ABO group. Uh, o negative could be then given to O positive and B negative could be given to AB positive. So let's go through that a little bit more in detail. You remember blood type B, you can give it to the blood type AB. And if it's now negative, uh, because we have that positive B, we could give it to that individual. Uh, probably a little bit better uh, in terms of getting our head around this is to have a look what we cannot do. Well, first of all, we remember that we could not give A to O, and in this case, it's A positive to O negative. Uh, we could not give AB to A, so you remember there's now that B that we don't have on the recipient, and that would cause issues. And in this case, it's that AB negative to A positive. AB positive to O, um, we remember that O's didn't have naturally have any of those antigens, so that would be a problematic there, and it doesn't matter really if it's a positive or negative, it would be problematic anyways, uh, as we've seen on all of these so far. Um, and it really doesn't matter whether it's a positive or negative, we just cannot give A, B to O. Uh, can we give A, B to B? Well, we are running into issues with the A antigens now being present again. So we can again ignore the RH because simply the ABO types would be an issue. And same for the B could not be given to an A. We can ignore the RH grouping there. I think I have a better question about the RH. So let's have a look of that. It should come up in a bit, and I'm not going into too much of uh, in those questions of expecting you to be able to tackle them. Um, but let's see, I just want to make sure. Uh, so if we, if we are predicting the effects of the hemopoiesis on blood disorders, we really didn't have a chance to talk too much about these. So there's more detail on your textbook, but um, if we can improve the condition by uh, increasing the production of the red blood cells. Well, conditions that would work here would be the sickle cell disease. So if we get the red blood cells being produced, either produced proper red blood cells or even sickle ones, if we have a greater number of those, we can deal with sickle cell disease. Same as with anemia, anemia was characterized by the lack of red blood cells. Hemolysis, so the breakdown of uh, hemes, uh, hemorrhage, loss of the blood uh, in great amounts, uh, bleeding, and hypoxia, so, uh, which was characterized by the low amounts of oxygen. All these could improve by giving red blood cells, improving the red blood cell production. Um, what could you do to deal with uh, small uh, deal, or what good would it do to? Uh, what conditions could benefit from having increased production of the white blood cells? Well, leukopenia would fall there, so a low amounts of white blood cells will definitely benefit from having increased production of the white blood cells, and if neither one of these uh, it's improved. Uh, in, or if it, neither having more red blood cells or having more white blood cells is improving the 
condition. Well, examples of these would be leukemia, hematology, primary polyuxemia, and secondary polyuxemia. Uh, we didn't get a chance to talk about these in the class. They are discussed a little bit more in your textbooks, uh, but really, if you are able to just group these at this level, that would be very much uh, the level of detail that I'm looking for. Um, let's have a look of a few others. Like I said, I some of these start repeating, so I'm not going to uh, go through everything in quite as much of a detail. Uh, components of the circulatory system. Again, the early uh, part of the lecture, we talked that you had the heart, which was the pump, the blood vessels were the tubing, and blood was the liquid being transported within so those three are what I'm looking there for the answer. Um, when we are talking about the blood formation, is this true, this question, statement? This statement is false when we're saying that blood formation in the bone marrow and lymphatic organs is called respectively lymphoid and myeloid hemophotesis. So um, the full explanation from the textbook is there this statement would not be correct, it would be untrue. Um, correct statement regarding function of platelets, they secrete proagulants, are clotting factors, which then promote the blood clotting. So that's the function of the platelets, promote the clotting, and that was accomplished through these proagulants. The next question that I have here is kind of filling in a gap. And uh, the statement goes along the lines that after tissue repair is completed, factor 12 catalyzes the formation of plasma enzyme called calicrane that in turn converts inactive plasminogen into plasmin a fibrin dissolving enzyme that breaks up the clot. So plasminogen gets converted into plasmin. That's really all you need to know here. And that's something that's discussed, again, a little bit more detailed information that's discussed in your textbook. And I have the full explanation there at the very bottom. Um, at this level, if you are just able to make that connection of plasminogen becomes plasmin, that'd be good. Uh, how can we prevent inappropriate clotting? So I'm asking you to classify the statements and characteristics with appropriate method of clotting pre uh, prevention. So how can we prevent clotting from happening? Repulsion, referred to it, occurs when the uh, blood vessels are undamaged and prostacycline coats their vessel walls. Dilution, normal rates of blood flow. Uh, account for it and circulatory shock interferes with that and anticoagulants uh, refer to antitrobin deactivating the thrombin before it can act on fibrinogen heparin which interferes with the formation of uh, prothrombin activator heparin is quite commonly used uh, it blocks the action on the thrombin of fibrinogen and promotes the action of antitrobin these all are topics that are only covered in your textbook, so we didn't get a chance to go into quite this much of a detail in the class in the about an hour that we had together. So uh, these are more advanced information, but something that would be good to tackle in a quest. Remember, you can use your textbook, you can refer to that, and the electronic textbook comes in super handy there. Um, I'm asking whether the statement that hemoglobin concentration and hematocrit are interchangeable in terms of how, to, how they are used uh, to describe the percentage of whole blood composed of red blood cells. Well, they are not interchangeable. The hematocrit is the percentage of the whole blood volume composed of red blood cells, whereas hemoglobin concentration is the measure of the concentration of hemoglobin in given volume of packed red blood cells. So it is a false statement that we have there. Um, I know that we're going to push a little bit on the time, so I'm going to uh, try to pick up the speed and stop at the ones that are super important for us. 
So which statement is not correct regarding blood groups other than ABO and RH? Um, we all of these, so I'm asking for the incorrect statement, uh, an incorrect statement uh, about other blood groups than ABO and RH. So you can use reverse engineering and look what would be true of these for the ABO and RH. And of course, what's true about ABO and RH is that they cause transfusion reactions. So here we are getting chance to explore a little bit of these other blood groups, uh, but really what I'm wanting you to do is pick what's true for ABO and RH. So uh, both of those could be a cause for transfusion reactions. Um, I'm asking about leukocytes here. So they spend only a few hours in the bloodstream and then migrate through the walls of the capillaries. So white blood cells really are not circulating for great amounts of time. They are very capable of crossing over back and forth uh, to the, uh, between the walls of the blood vessels. Um, I'm asking to, in this question to organize the stages in the development of white blood cells. So we're starting with the first to the last. So first we have these hemopoietic stem cells, then they form the colony forming units, which made the precursor cells that gave us the mature cells. So right at the beginning of what we just reviewed, we had this visually and now I'm just asking it uh, kind of uh, verbally. So remember, it's the same stem cells where it all starts and it all ends with mature cells. And before we end up with mature cells, we have precursor cells. So that leaves the colony forming units to be, in, uh, be the second step in the process. Uh, let's have a look of the blood disorders and their definitions. Again, another thing that we didn't have a chance to dive in, that's covered in your textbook, uh, septicemia is the bacteria in the bloodstream. That would be very troublesome for us. Thrombocybinia, a platelet counts that's below uh, the threshold that we have defined as normal. Disseminated intravascular coagulation refers to the widespread clotting within unbroken vessels. So there's nothing wrong with the vessels, but we are finding clotting happening there. Um, thalassemia, uh, deficiency or absence of alpha and beta hemoglobin, and infectious mononucleotides refer to the infection of B lymphocytes with Epstein-Barr virus. So all of these are covered in the actual textbook, not uh, in the lecture material content. But remember, you can use your textbook as you are working through these quizzes. So quizzes are not only there to test you what you know, quizzes are also a chance to learn new material. Uh, I asked about the hemoglobin molecules. You remember there were four heme groups, so able to, because of that to carry the four oxygen uh, molecules. So four is the magic number there. Um, we are listing the leukocytes from the most abandoned to the least abandoned. And this is, of course, in a healthy, normal individual. So we remember our mnemonic, never let monkeys eat bananas. So neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. That's from the most common, which was the neutrophils, to the least common, which was the basophils. Uh, a lot of themes that we have discussed. The the function of the fibrin is to create the framework for the blood clot. So blood clot to happen first needs to have kind of that scaffolding, if you wish, and the fibrin was responsible for that. Um, hypoxemia, what happens there? And the uh, what we're wanting to do here is to uh, answer just scrolling down, answer that how does the bone marrow help to reverse hypoxemia? It's by accelerated erythropoiesis. So 
production of the red blood cells imp uh, increases uh, thanks to the bone marrow if we are going through hypoxemia. And the, all the information here on this picture helps to explain what happens. So really, this question is just for you to read the picture. That's all I'm asking there. We're kind of trying to train you to become more familiar with the concept of uh, data analysis. Uh, if we are talking about the, how hemoglobin gets broken down and disposed, uh, hemoglobin was broken in to iron unit and then to the bilirubin that then became became removed through the feces. Iron can be stored and reused. Some of it is lost uh, through the bleeding during menstrual cycle. You can lose in a, when you bleed blood, lose that in general. And then we do have a bunch of free amino acids that get hydrolyzed also in the process. So what product of hemoglobin degradation is broken down into biliverdin and iron that would be the heme group that gets broken uh, into iron and biliverdin. In terms of the um, ABO blood groups, what we're seeing here is the components that these sprinkles, if you wish, that we saw uh, took place. And I'm asking what blood type would be labeled as number four. So here we're seeing both A and B sprinkles rather than where we saw A, B or no sprinkles. So when we have both, that would have to be the A, B. So like you see as such. So really reading a picture a little. And what we are doing here, we are trying to identify the agglutinin, and these would be antibodies. Antibodies have these, remember the characteristic shape that we often show in diagrams. Antibodies can be many different other shapes as well, but uh, textbooks prefer to use this kind of a Y shape. So that's your clue to tackle that question. A um, couple of other questions that are important. Um, so this is what we'll be doing in a class. We will be defining the ABO blood type by using anti-A, anti-B. If we are seeing a reaction like this, we're seeing clotting happening here and not there. So this would be type A. So that's what's going on there. Uh, this is something that I think will become a little bit more familiar once we actually complete the lab together in a class tomorrow. So if that feels a little strange after tomorrow, you should feel more comfortable with it. Uh, here I'm asking you to know, uh, to tell apart which are elements that we are likely to find or components that we are likely to find in plasma and which of these are formed elements. So remember, plasma was the matrix and formed elements include our red blood cells, platelets, red blood cells, platelets, and white blood cells. And there's only a few of the white blood cells that are listed here. Everything else is going to be within the plasma, such as hormones, uh, glucose, antibodies, fibrinogens, chlorides, so if it's not a formed element, you're going to find it within the plasma. And carrying on on that, um, predicting the influence of disease and environment on the number of selected formed elements. So what do we find uh, to increase if we do have uh, high, if we're in high altitude, the erythrocytes are more likely to become increased, so high altitude promoted the red blood cell production, uh, long-term hypoxia. So again, if you're not getting enough oxygen in response to that, to tissues, in response to that, we are producing more red blood cells. If you have some sort of an infection, in this case, influenza that's going around, 
well, B lymphocytes would be then increased in response to that. So in response to an infection, B lymphocytes are the type of white blood cells that especially increase. Uh, if you do have chronic asthma, basophils are probably going to be uh, increased. And you remember the parasitic infections, eosinophils were the response to that. Uh, if what decreases then, if you don't get enough iron from your diet, uh, your red blood cell numbers will go down. So we want to make sure that there's sufficient iron in the diet. Uh, one way to tackle is the supplements. Erythropoietin hyposecretion, again, would cause uh, decreased red blood cell numbers, declining intrinsic factor, and acute significant bleeding as well will result in the loss of red blood cells. The acute viral infection really will not have an uh, effect on the red blood cell numbers there. Um, I'm aware that we're pushing it in wind times, so I'm going to just uh, kind of quickly have a look of this. So here we're asking only, about, uh, we're still talking about the blood types, and I'm asking you about the AB and O, and in, term, in terms of the positive negative, the AB in this case is RH positive, and blood type O is RH negative. So we are expressing all major antigens, uh, in this case of AB positive, this is the universal acceptor. They could receive a blood from anyone, really, a least common blood type in the US. So we do end up seeing that there's often searches for donors who would be this blood type, and they do express the A antineglutogen. A blood type O, uh, they do express all major antibodies. So you remember there were no sprinkles naturally on the surface. These were the universal donors, uh, a most common U.S. blood type, and they express also the B antigluteny. Then, um, I just have a really quick question. Yes, of I'm course. still a little bit confused between like the positive and the negative. Yes, um, basically the positive and negative goes, and let me just jump on the screen to another screen. So let me pull up the what I had for you in the class. And it should be this PowerPoint. So let me do this slide. No, that's not the one that I was after. Let's see. No, that's not the one. Let me just save that and close that. So here we should have better luck. So when we are talking about the positive or negative. We remember that the uh, if you have, um, most of the Americans are RH positive, and that related to having the RH factor D. That all is just good information, not something you need to worry about. But if you have an um, individual uh, that is RH Let's, let's go with negative, Rh negative. If you have anti-Rh antibodies, so these would attack someone who would be negative, this would be a problem. So you don't want to be uh, receiving blood or having blood mixture from someone who has antibodies against of that, whether you're positive or negative. Um, this really will cause a problem, like I said, only if the bloods have mixed and then there's an exposure. So going with this question that we were looking at, let's go there. So here, um, 
with this question, we saw that the uh, really on this question, you really wouldn't need to worry about the positive or negative. I think we're tackling all of these with the uh, a B plot typing the positive here that that expresses the uh, RH positivity, which was the 85% of all Americans. So that would be the only one there that tackles. I'm trying to think of how to go about explaining the positive negative without going into too much of a detail. I think it's going to become more clear when we conduct the lab tomorrow. Um, if if uh, it doesn't, then I'll just add a little lecture to the beginning of that. Uh, so I don't know if that really answers your question. Yeah, I think it, it makes more sense to me now. I was confused yeah. when you were talking about which what types can transfer to which like other ones, but I think I got it now. I totally get that it's confusing. It really, I would at this point focus on the ABO and then the positive negative. I know the question that you were looking, it was a little earlier on. They're really what you want to do. Focus on the ABO and then if they match, then you're good. And the positive negative, that's kind of a side side journey on that. Uh, but I appreciate it. I do realize that we're a little bit over the time. So if you do have to go, I totally understand it. Uh, I'm going to go through these just for the sake of recording as well. Uh, but I try to go through them quickly. So if there's anything uh, that anyone wants to have a look through later on. OK, I think I'll stay for probably a little bit longer okay. and then I'll have to go. I promise I'll try to do it in about five to 10 minutes. OK, perfect. <laughs> I just don't want to be uh, unappreciative of your time. Uh, so I really appreciate that we went a little longer. What we're seeing here, I'm asking to uh, drag again labels to the uh, indicating what step of the hemostasis is going on. So hemostasis refers to the clot formation or the uh, plug or uh, scab, whatever term you wish to use. And this process really moves from first having a vascular spasm. And by vascular spasm, we're talking about that the blood vessel, the blood vessel wall that's broken now, goes through vasoconstriction. So it starts to shrink the diameter. So we have less bleeding going through that broken wall just by simply making the hole smaller. So that's the spasm part. And this is really the first stage of responding to the bleeding or broken uh, blood vessel wall that we try to decrease physically by making the space where the blood is leaking out smaller. The next stage is that where we start to form the platelet plug. This is not yet complete plug, but this is the start of that. Again, second stage in the process, um, we have disruption, a disruption of prostacycline. We haven't had a chance to talk about that, but um, you can think of it as that being covered in a greater detail on the uh, textbook, but just leave that as not placing it into anywhere just yet and do the process of elimination, what you're left with. Um, the initial platelet blood formation uh, results from being exposed to these uh, endothelial collagen. So that's uh, these collagen fibers that are located outside the blood vessel. Uh, is blood vessel's um, center, if you wish. And uh, there's another more detailed explanation, which goes to the material that's only covered in the textbook. So including the degradulation on serot and serotonin throwbacks in A2 and ADP. Uh, so these two would be something that we haven't had a chance to talk about in greater detail. Coagulation, last step of hemostasis, known as clotting. In this, what happens, we're turning the fibrin gen into fibrin. So you see on this 
picture even the fiber-like cloth being formed and this does include both intrinsic and extrinsic mechanisms so um, there's a lot more steps involved there but really if you start by putting them in order and then you start by describing what happens the vasoconstriction smaller hole uh, build up of the um, of the initial platelet plug due to these collagen fibers that are being exposed and last step then the conversion of materials to form this um, fiber more fibrous cloth um, next question that i have is a uh, coagulation pathways we haven't talked about extrinsic and intrinsic pathways um, these are then uh, end up coming together as a common pathway coagulation so what we're seeing uh, this would be covered in the textbook so intrinsic uh, pathway includes the factor 12 factor 9 and factor 11 whereas the extrinsic is all about what are we seeing happening um, so such as uh, damage to the vascular tissue factor 3 which is the thrombovastin and factor 7. Um, all other factors then fall within the common pathway here we're seeing thrombin activator and fibrin crossing linking as well uh, i know that that's a lot since we haven't had a chance to discuss it but the description that i have here really summarizes it quite nicely and that description is directly from your textbook so um i would not feel bad if you say that I can't pull the answer to this question out of my just mind uh, because we haven't had a chance to explore it but use your textbook to guide you to match these to the right boxes so that would help you and remember this session is going to be also recorded so you can refer back to that as well uh, I'm asking you to place the following formed elements in order of how common they are and we do remember that um, plasma was of course the most common but that's not the formed element so plasma was about 55 percent of the blood volume but then we get to the um what is what what is left in terms of the um, of the formed elements so red blood cells 45 percent of the total con the con content of the blood um, erythrocytes is the most common platelets and leukocytes both less than one percent of the total blood volume and you remember that the leukocytes are white blood cells could be organized based on this mnemonic never let monkeys eat bananas so neutrophils lymphocytes monocytes eosinophils and basophils would be the ones to use there um, i'm asking the correct statements regarding composition of plasma here um, water is the main component of plasma albumin was the most common protein that we saw there and uh, in terms of the waste products that we end up seeing in plasma really the urea would be the most common there um we the statement on the water uh, that's incorrect remember that it's more than 90 percent and the statement on the protein that's not gonna be correct as well um uh, in in terms of this uh, this question uh, which of this is not a function of platelets we do remember that platelets stick together to form a temporary platelet plug to seal the small breaks uh if it's not requiring and and more of an uh, intense response uh they do internalize and destroy bacteria as well secrete growth factors and these growth ha factors help us to uh make make materials that help us to maintain and repair the blood vessels and they also help with the clot dissolving enzyme uh, that dissolve the blood clots uh, if if they have uh, 
still remained after they are no longer needed. So the only statement that is not true, they have that it is not true that they would inhibit proagulants, platelets promote the proagulants. Um, so the next one here, uh, accurate statement about two reaction pathways that lead to the common pathway of coagulation. So um, the intrinsic mechanism uses only clotting factors found in the blood itself. And the, in most cases of bleeding, both extrinsic and intrinsic mechanisms work simultaneously. And the extrinsic was initiated by clotting factors rele released by the damaged blood vessel. So if you think of the intrinsic, it's all about the uh, what we find in the blood itself, whereas extrinsic is from triggers from outside the blood itself. And um, the next question, in healthy blood vessels, platelets do not adhere because of the smooth endothelium is covered with prostacycline. We didn't get a chance to go through that. Again, something that's mentioned in the textbook. So uh, either just review the description below or refer to your textbook when you're tackling this question in the quiz. Um, Describing hemophilia, so bleeding disease, it is a sex-linked recessive uh, recessive disorder. So inherited uh, in sex chromosomes, uh, most hemophilia is uh, found in males because of being linked to the sex and uh, classical hemophilia, hemophilia type A, is caused by the lack of factor except eight, and uh, hemophilia B, type B, is caused by the lack of factor nine. We didn't get a chance to talk too much about hemophilia, so again, either referring to the textbook when you're picking up these statements, um, or the description below. What is not true, what's being uh, sta stated here, is that males would inherit it either from mother or father. Of course, that's not true since it's going to be sex-linked. So father would be the uh, contributing part there that we want to um, keep on, or that we want to keep on mind that that's a sex-linked one. Um, what are the two principal functions of erythrocytes? To pick the oxygen and deliver it to the tissues and pick the carbon dioxide uh, from the tissues and take it to the lungs. So really the gas transport is the red blood cells main function. And uh, following characteristics of a red blood cell, um, increasing its ability to carry oxygen to the tissues. Well, uh, we did not have cell organelles. So we are not going to use that oxygen that the red blood cell is transporting because there's no cell organelles that would burn it away. Um, the cytoplasm of red blood cell consists mainly of a 33% solution of hemoglobin. So there's a great amount of hemoglobin that played a role in carrying the oxygen. Red blood cells lose nearly all organelles during their development. So again, going back to that, there were no cell organelles there and having no nucleus and DNA, the red blood cells are not, are not capable of protein synthesis and mitosis. So they are stuck to what they are. They're not going to do more. So really it comes down to do with the red blood cells that they're ideally adapted on transporting oxygen and not consuming the oxygen along the way. Uh, Newborn diseases uh, and uh, hemolytic diseases, blood diseases. So the problem was when we had the positive and negative being different. So mother is one, the child is another one. And mother would be negative, child is positive. 
this would be a problem because the mother would then end up rejecting the baby. First pregnancy is not going to be a problem, but once these two bloods have mixed, as normally happens with uh, during the delivery, uh, I've never seen a delivery where blood of the uh, baby and the mother wouldn't have gotten mixed. It's the second pregnancy that becomes a problem. Um, the placental tearing causes that now these bloods are mixed uh, and that's the, that's where the problems start. And uh, if the mother becomes pregnant again, she might be able to pass some of these uh, antibodies through the placenta and cause issue for the uh, fetus that's developing a fetus is red blood cell. So again, remember second pregnancy, different, in terms of having one uh, Rh negative and Rh positive, so they're not the same. And second pregnancy, because the bloods have mixed, those would be the key points of the Rh positive, Rh negative discussion. Uh, this is the question that I was trying to find desperately when you asked about that. In addition to ABO and Rh groups, there are more than 30 other known blood groups uh, but they are really not studied in that much of a detail because we don't, they're not as relevant for the transfusion reactions. And that statement is true. So remember ABO and RH were the most relevant in terms of the transfusion reactions. Here we're matching erythrocyte disorders to its cause or definition. So we have again bunch. Uh, we have only really had a chance to talk about sickle cell anemia uh, in the class, and that was because the allele modified the chain of amino acids. Um, so that was the uh, mutation that caused the amino acid chain to be altered that had a significant effect on the shape of the resulting red blood cell, which looked sickled. Uh, there are others that, again, uh, I would refer to the textbook uh, in terms of getting a good description of each one of these when you're tackling this question, or you can refer to this uh, slide on this uh, review session if that, that feels like something that could help you. Um, in terms of the red blood cell measurements and their uh, their definitions, the red blood cell count referred to the total number of red blood cells in the blood. Uh, hemoglobin concentration re refers to the concentration of hemoglobin in a given volume of, uh, of red blood cells that are packed together. And hematocrit is the percentage of whole blood volume composed of red blood cells. So again, definitions, uh, we really talked about the red blood cell count only. Hematocrit, for example, is an important uh, clinical criteria that we use, but um, we didn't unfortunately have a chance to too much of a look at that. Um, few leukocyte disorders and their definitions. We remember that leukopenia was where we had a low amount of white blood cells. Leukemia is a type of cancer that produces high number of leukocytes and their precursors. As myeloid leukemia characterized by marked uncontrolled granulocyte production. Lymphoid leukemia involves uncontrolled lymphocyte and monocyte production. Leukocytosis, so we have high amount of white blood cells, acute leukemia, sudden, so that makes the acute part and progresses rapidly, uh, causes death within months. And chronic leukemia is a much slower and can go for months undetected. Again, textbook would be a good reference for other than the leukopenia and leukocytosis, which we had a chance to talk. We talked about leukemia also in general level, but not, not uh, going to the subgroups. I'm asking the uh, white blood cells to be matched with how common they are here. So again, remember the never for neutrophils, let for lymphocytes, uh, monkeys for monocytes, 
eat eosinophils and basophils for the banana. So never let monkeys eat bananas was the mnemonic there. You'll notice I've asked it quite a few times, so that's a good one to know as a mnemonic. Um, values that are correct for human blood, uh, these would be, we discussed about the pH being between 7.35 to 7.45, uh, the total volume of blood somewhere around 5-6 liters, depending on your body size, um, and the Two others we didn't get a chance to talk about the osmolarity of the blood is somewhere around 280 to 290 to 96 uh, and white blood cell count uh, about 5 to 10,000 per microliter. So those would be covered in greater detail on the textbook, but we had a couple of them tackled. Uh, I'm asking that which one would be the most abundant plasma protein, and that was albumin. We talked about that in the class. And um, plasma transports, which of the following? Well, plasma transports nutrients, oxygen, uh, and nitrogenous wastes. Uh, so one thing that we didn't really get a chance to talk yet, we'll actually talk about this in a later chapter, not all oxygen is transported just um, by the uh, red blood cells, uh, also some through the plasma. Uh, erythropoiesis, production of the red blood cells, I'm asking to organize those in order, and I think we've either revisited or we are asking this question again, or we've talked about it before. You remember stem cells is where it all starts, and final red blood cell erythrocyte is where it ends. The second step was the colony forming units, then erythroblasts, reticulocytes, and erythrocytes. So, um, questions that are repeated are, are often good ones. Here, uh, referring to the Rh positive negative, again, you don't have to worry about that, but just stick with the R, uh, ABO blood type. Here we have an individual with A antigens, but no P antigens. Well, you remember the antigens were the sprinkles that we talked about. If you have A's, you are type A. And... Uh, Individuals with which blood types will have anti-A agglutins on their plasma. So anti-A's would be with type B and type O. If you have, if you are type A or type AB, uh, you do not have anti-A. So again, the positive negative you don't have to worry about there. Um, the uh, ABO blood type that we're seeing here, that's going to be blood type B. We're seeing and we'll discuss this in our class uh, when we complete the lab. You'll be completing it for your own blood types. And uh, this is a similar one. We're seeing the clotting of both, so it's going to be AB. So based on what you see the reaction to. And final question that I have to mention is, again, here, we don't see clotting on either one, so it's going to be blood type O. So that covers all of the questions that we had for the uh, quiz. I know that that was a lot, and I'm so sorry I kept you over time, but I am making a note, and that definitely counts as extra credit once we are doing your final grade. Uh, that pretty much completes everything I had plan to cram on this session. I know we ran over time, so I appreciate you sticking around. If you have any questions, this is a great time. I'm going to be more than happy to answer, uh, kind of referring back to what you asked about the RH positive negative. Just don't let that throw you off too much. Uh, we'll stick to the basics on this class. I think I'm good. I don't have any other questions. So thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate you sticking around and I hope you have a very good rest of the a day and I'll see yeah, you. You too. Bye. Bye. And that completes our recording for this session. I am going to have a similar session 
on the in the evening um, and on that one I'll probably have a little bit fancier uh, PowerPoint slides but we'll cover the exact same material. Uh, so until then, thank you for joining.